Hello everybody, Slim Kirby here. Wow, I can't believe 15 years have passed since my very first YouTube upload. And no, I'm not talking about playing catch in the cafeteria, although I do think it's pretty humorous that if people do go back that far, that is the earliest upload on this channel. Oh gosh, I got that. I got that. Yes. But no, my first actual upload was not a camcorded video, nor was it a let's play or walkthrough, or even a long winded video with me talking for 20 minutes straight. It was actually a top 10 video. A video in dedication to my top 10 SNES games. At the time, anyway. However, where is this video now? It's no longer on my channel, and there is no conceivable way to watch it at this point. Well, if you must know, due to my ignorance at the time in regards to music copyright, I decided to include audio from Europe's The Final Countdown and Queen's We Are The Champions in this video. And sure enough, when YouTube started going hard on copyright a few years later, I did the most logical thing I could do and think of at that point, and removed any videos that had any sort of copyrighted music involved. This included my early walkthroughs, my first two Mario Party board playthroughs, and of course, my very first YouTube upload. However, I think it's kind of unfortunate that this video is gone, just because it was my actual first video on YouTube, and I don't think playing Catch in the Cafeteria really does my channel any sort of nostalgic justice, despite what my oldest fans will probably say. So a few years ago, I came up with the idea of redoing my very first YouTube upload, just so I could get it back on my channel in some form and have that bit of Slim Kirby history represented in a visual format. However, instead of a simple redo, since I have played a lot more SNES games since July 4th, 2007, I figured, why not just update the list in general? Since not only have my opinions changed over time, I'll also more than likely have some new additions to the list as well. And since I'm doing this on my 15th year anniversary, let's just upgrade this list to a top 15 as well. So today, I present to you guys Slim Kirby's Top 15 SNES Games. As usual, this list is completely based on my own personal opinion, meaning that I will more than likely not see eye to eye with you guys on every single individual game and possible ranking involved. And that's fine. If you guys would like to share your own Top 15s or Top 10s, be my guest and leave a comment below. Just don't take it personally if your goaded game isn't at or close to my number one position, or even on the list at all. We're all going to see things differently and have different opinions. So, without further ado, let's get the list started. Number 15. Before I announce what number 15 will be, I want to go ahead and state for the record that Super Mario All-Stars will not be appearing on this list. While I do really love the game, and while I do think it's the greatest SNES compilation piece, all four games included are technically NES games with updated graphics and built-in save systems. It's a great game for sure, but probably shouldn't qualify for this list. So instead, let's focus on an original Mario game for the slot with Super Mario Kart. Ah, uh, Super Mario Kart, the very first Mario Kart game. What a journey this series has been on over the years, huh? Well, I'm not gonna lie or sugarcoat it for you guys. If you are a more modern Mario Kart enthusiast, coming back to Super Mario Kart isn't exactly the easiest. It was the first game, after all. But as someone who grew up with the game and had to learn the best way to drive and maneuver through all the tricky tracks and deal with the fiendish AI, I don't know, I guess I just have a deeper appreciation for what this game introduces as a series pilot. And in a strange way, I almost kind of think this game ages better than Mario Kart 64. Not by much, mind you, but still. Nevertheless, this is still a game I don't mind going back to for a short race down memory lane. It doesn't have a lot of content or characters, but enough for one of those short pick up and play sessions that I tend to have every now and then. Perfect game for the 15th slot and the second best racing game on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Number 14. Yes, you heard me right at the end there. I said second best racing game on the SNES. If Super Mario Kart is my second favorite, what just so happens to be my first favorite? 
Well, let's not have too many mysteries lingering around on this list for too long, because my 14th favorite SNES game just so happens to be that favorite racing game, and that honor belongs to Uniracers. Uniracers is not your typical racing game. For one, instead of carts and cars, we are racing on unicycles, and instead of a 3D track layout, this is a 2D platform racer. You race an opposing unicycle to the end of a course filled with loops, jumps, obstacles, and alternate paths and shortcuts. In addition to overcoming these trials, you can perform stunts and tricks that can increase your speed and also give you high scores on the designated stunt tracks you'll have to qualify through. There are a whopping 9 cups in this game, giving a total of 36 racing courses and 9 stunt competitions. Way more content than what Mario Kart has to offer, and has a plethora of different multiplayer options to boot as well, including a league mode that logistically opens up the doors for an 8-person multiplayer fest. Definitely something way ahead of its time for a system that initially debuted with only two controller ports. I really like the potential that this game has to offer, and with the metal system of the single player mode, you really start to feel your skill improve as you get further into the game and unlock more of the racing cups. It may not have the colorful charm and personality of Super Mario Kart, but I do think it offers a lot more and is an absolute hidden gem of the SNES console library. Also the entire soundtrack of this game, absolute banger. Number 13. I'd say this game is a more recent addition to my top 15, but make no mistake, this game absolutely belongs on this list, and I'm sure in a few years, I could see this game being even higher on this list as well. But 13th place goes to Mega Man X. Make no mistake, the Mega Man series on the NES is an absolute classic series, and even the 7th game on the SNES was fine for what it was. However, Capcom went hard with this title, and gave Mega Man a hardcore upgrade, and that upgrade made the classic gameplay even better. It still plays like Mega Man, but it has so much more going for it. A dash move, a wall cling, even more cool weapons and upgrades, a charge shot variation for each of those weapons, bigger and cooler bosses, this game absolutely rocks. And no, I'm not talking about the music either, but while I'm on the subject, damn this soundtrack is good. Now, I'll admit, at the time of me recording this, I've still yet to play Mega Man X2 and X3, so you will not see those games on this list. However, I did play Mega Man X4 last year, and thought it was a really fun experience, so I expect the other two games to be a nice treat as well. If those games manage to crack into this list though, well, that's future Slim Kirby's problem. Number 12. You guys know me, I'm a huge fan of golf, but I wouldn't say there are very many great golfing games on the Super Nintendo. Me and my dad had a Pebble Beach golf game that was incredibly mediocre, but for the longest time there just weren't really any games that satisfied that golfing itch for me. That is until I discovered the game Kirby's Dream Course. Okay, so it's not a traditional golfing game by any means, but it's honestly a lovely mix of miniature golf and Kirby games. You destroy enemies by rolling into them, turning the last one into the hole, and trying to get into that hole in as few strokes as possible. Along the way, you'll have obstacles, insane hole layouts, and perhaps the most Kirby-like feature, the inclusion of power-ups that give you some unique ways to approach every hole and obstacle in front of you. The skill ceiling for this game can be a bit intimidating at times. Heck, I wasn't able to unlock everything in this game until I did my Let's Play back in 2010, but even then, just the fact that I was able to look so highly at this game and not even be aware of the fact that I only seen half of the game's content as a kid is honestly a pretty cool prospect. Also, the multiplayer in this game is really, really good as well, and is probably one of the game's biggest highlights. Seriously, they should really consider doing a follow-up to this game, now that the Kirby universe has expanded quite a bit since 1994. Number 11. Coming in at just below the top 10 is the third game in a highly beloved series known as Donkey Kong Country, with Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie's Double Trouble. Now, in an effort to not spoil the rest of this list and where I theoretically could have the other two games, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time comparing the trilogy games together and really only focus on the things that I do love about this game in particular. After all, I honestly think this game is highly underrated when speaking of the trilogy. 
I definitely get the complaints and concerns about the later parts of the game being a bit of a slog to get through, and of all three trilogy games, this game is perhaps the most bloated in terms of collectibles. But the game's originality and its level design is honestly quite the sight to behold, and I love that Rareware kind of went a bit over the top with this one. Being chased by a giant saw, climbing a rope on fire, feeding a hungry piranha, and swimming in a sewer pipe filled with liquid that reverses your controls may not seem like the most natural level concepts, especially when you compare them with the more atmospheric levels of the first game, but they are at least memorable, and not in a purely negative sense, although I do really despise Kongfi's cliffs and I am not coming off of that hill. I also really like how in addition to the level exploration, Rare also tried to encourage exploration on the world map as well, making this world feel even bigger than the previous two games. Also, I do love me some David Wise, but I have to give major kudos to Eveline Fisher's compositions to the musical score just because they feel very different from what we got in the previous two games, and I mean that in a very good way. Sometimes we need a bit of variety and personal charm, even if what we got previously was already pretty damn good. DKC3 shows us that it can be a little quirky and different in its presentation, and still deliver a knockout punch for the trilogy as a whole. Number 10. This is a game I feel incredibly confident will turn some heads in regards to its placement, as this is often a game I see as a frontrunner or first place in a lot of these top SNES lists. The reason for this particular placement is definitely due to my lack of personal nostalgia for this title, as I played through it for the first time only a few years ago. However, there was no possible way I could overlook this title for a spot on this list, because after playing it, I can definitely see why Chrono Trigger is listed as one of the best SNES games of all time, because it most certainly is. For a system that is knockout RPG after knockout RPG, Chrono Trigger is the absolute blueprint for what a great RPG should be. Great characters, great story, a great unique battle system, a great presentation of sound graphics and overall premise, and I'm not even someone who is incredibly fond of the whole time traveling trope either but Chrono Trigger masterfully handles it in a way that even got me to become a believer of it being able to work in a comprehensible way, and for that, I give it major props. I think another thing that gives this game a lot of longevity is also the fact that it has a multitude of endings and character storyline quests that keep you coming back and trying to discover more of what the world and the story behind it, and that's something you should always be striving for in an RPG of this magnitude. All of this and more makes Chrono Trigger an easy choice for an SNES Top 10, and who knows, maybe in a few years after getting to experience more of the game, maybe, just maybe, it could score even higher on this list. But for now, I think making it into the Top 10 is a very worthy and admirable accomplishment. Number 9. There's a rumble in the jungle and... it's Donkey Kong Country. Yeah, I think it's no surprise that there is more than just one DKC game on this list, just because, let's face it, Rareware knew what they were doing with this series. Platformers like Mario, when it came to their level design, were fairly straightforward with maybe a few secret areas and power-ups along the way to reward those who may be curious about a certain block or pipe placement. While you could say the same thing about the DKC bonus areas, with a built-in game percentage tracker, I'd almost say Rare was a lot more encouraging about discovering these secrets, giving players a reason to continually enter and re-enter levels until that exclamation point showed at the end of the level name on the map screen to show that they had looked through everything there was to explore and find all the bonus areas in that particular level. And even if that level exploration isn't your cup of tea, and trust me, there are some secrets in this game that could warrant that resignation, you could also just beat the game normally and not really miss out on any content, which is smart from a game design perspective since it doesn't alienate any of its players based on their level of perfectionism. With a great atmosphere of soundtrack, truly impressive visuals for its time, which I think still stand out today, and a game that offers a solid but very fair challenge from the very beginning to the very end, Donkey Kong Country is a game that will forever stand its ground as a foundation for an excellent SNES game and series. Number 8. While it is always fun to see how a series makes a transformation from console to console, 
I've always been quite partial to the jump from NES to Super NES because I really feel like that was when a lot of the series made very significant updates and improvements to their formulas and make them more accessible games as a result. And this factor is definitely true of Samus Aran's venture on the SNES in the form of Super Metroid, the third game in Metroid's initial timeline. In addition to being a follow-up with updated graphics, new items and boss fights, and expanded lore for its universe and characters, Super Metroid included perhaps the biggest quality of life addition in the form of an in-game map. Gone are the days where you had to map out the world of Zebus for yourself or depend on a player's guide for overworld exploration, because now you have a built-in feature that shows where you've been, what places are left to explore, and to a lesser extent, what items and upgrades you may have missed or need to come back to with an expanded inventory. And with the inclusion of more convenient upgrades like the speed booster and x-ray scope, traversing the planet is so much faster and finding hidden secrets and alternate pathways is so much easier to manage this time around. I think this game's biggest strength though is the fact that it pretty much encourages sequence breaking. For example, at some point in the game you can get trapped in a steep pit and the local wildlife teaches you how to escape via wall jumping. However, you having this move is not dependent on reaching this point. In fact, it's something you've been able to do since the very beginning of the game. So when you see a highly placed missile tank in Brinstar, although it looks like the game intends for you to come back later with high jump boots or the grappling hook, you can actually use a wall jump to grab it on your first go through the area if you so choose. This can make future playthroughs not only easier, but also significantly faster the more techniques you learn and use to your advantage. None of these sequence breaks really feel game-breaking either, almost like the developers actually intended for players to figure out this stuff on their own and make their clear time shorter. I mean, why else would they keep track of game time after all? To me, it's no shock that Super Metroid is one of the most popular speedrunning games in the history of video games because the game was most certainly made for it. This game set a new standard for Metroid titles and my god, what a standard it was. Number 7. This is another game that I didn't have the pleasure of playing until fairly recently, within the last couple of years anyway, and was perhaps the biggest highlight for me when I did the SNES Classic Completion series on my Twitch channel. It's a game and series that needs no introduction or much explanation for why it's on a list of this magnitude, but for 7th place, I have landed on Final Fantasy VI previously known as Final Fantasy III in the United States, but I'll be referring to it as Final Fantasy VI for the purpose of this video. Final Fantasy VII is perhaps my favorite game on the PlayStation 1, so I went into Final Fantasy VI with some pretty high expectations, and although it won't get the same exact comparable honors, I say this game still delivered on those high expectations in a pretty big way. And keep in mind, my entire childhood was spent on the SNES, so I had a pretty high bar to match here. But yeah, FF6 is truly a fantastic and unforgettable experience. I loved and got invested in the characters, each one having their own story to tell and their own stakes in the conflict as a whole, and none of the characters really feel irrelevant either. Sure, the plot focuses hard on Terra at first, and the Figaro brothers get a bit of time in the limelight, and Celeste comes into a pretty big role by the midpoint, but there are many other characters you'll meet in this game, and I found myself caring about every single one of them, and soaking up as much backstory as I could, regardless of how much or how little there was to them. And the main villain? Probably the most appropriate choice for a villain in the sense that you really want to take him down by the end of it. But that's all I'm going to say in the interest of not spoiling anything. I think the thing that really got me into this game, as an RPG and just a game in general, was just how much there was to do, but also how accessible it was just to do about anything and everything. Heck, even Final Fantasy VII had some side quests and super bosses that I just didn't have the stomach or attention span to focus on, but in FF6, I went forth and did every single one of them, and didn't rest or head for the end game until I knew everything on my checklist was done. And it never really got boring or repetitive either. With a large cast of characters, I was constantly swapping my team around and giving more battle and magic EXP to units that needed it and trying new team compositions and strategies that could give me even more success in battle. Yes, there was a bit of a grind to it, but it was an engaging grind that never really felt dull or mindless and that's something I can appreciate. Also, Nobuo Iwamatsu, I can't forget about you, you brilliant mind of music. 
After I was finished with this adventure, I couldn't help but add such a huge number of tracks from this game to my music playlist. From Edgar and Sabin's theme, to Terra's theme, Searching for Friends, Decisive Battle, to the opera scene. My god, this soundtrack slaps so freaking hard. So yeah, when you have RPGs like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, you know that the SNES had a lot of hard hitters for this genre. And trust me, there are still plenty more to come. Will any more be on this list though? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Number 6. I don't mean to babysit you guys here at this next choice, but the next slot is a game that needs no introduction on my channel, as I've played through it a number of times for you guys. Although, you could probably say that for a number of SNES games on my channel. Still though, clocking in at number 6, just below the top 5, we have Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. That's right, Baby Mario's crying might be annoying, but it's not annoying enough to hold back any sort of praise with this title. This is a game that has always just jived very well with me, and much like Donkey Kong Country before it, it's a game that you can enjoy just by playing through it casually, or if you're a perfectionist like myself, you can take the challenge of getting 100 points on every level and going the extra mile with it. I know that some people may not be bothered to take on that perfectionist challenge, and that's fair, scouting every level for every red coin and flower, and mitigating as many hits as possible so you don't lose stars, can seem like a bit of a chore at times. But with how lively and colorful this world is, it's hard not to love the adventure and exploration gained from the extra time that's potentially spent here, and I'm fine with that time investment. It's also just fun looking at the world of Mario from a different time. Yeah, you'll see a lot of similar characters and enemies, but you'll also see plenty of new ones and different variations of enemies we are familiar with. Also, I just really love the sprite work and the backgrounds in this game. It looks absolutely stunning. And the musical presentation is pretty solid as well. Even I made a song off of the Flower Garden theme when I did my Let's Play all those years ago. But yeah, even though this game didn't quite make the top 5 in this list, it still pretty much feels like a top 5 game for me. And I could honestly see the same with a lot of the other titles below this as well. There's just 5 other games that I think really, really hit it out of the park for me. And we're going to be talking about those next. Number 5. Some of you may have seen this one coming based on how the list has been going so far, but maybe not as high as top 5 honors are concerned. However, I can say for absolute certainty that when it comes to Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, these honors are more than well deserved. What sets DKC2 apart from DKC1 and DKC3? Honestly, not much, but the best way I can describe it is that this game encapsulates what made the original game so great, while also improving on and intensifying the formula, but also having some form of control over its content and not going overboard with some aspects of its level design, something that can and has been seen as a problem from the trilogy's finale. In other words, I think it's the most balanced of the three games, striking that harmonious combination of the first game's atmospheric exploration, while also having that unique and personal charm, something I think the third game did quite well. So in a way, I think Diddy's Conquest excels at both. Another way you could look at it is that DKC1 was the palate cleanser and or appetizer, DKC2 is the main course, and DKC3 is the sweet dessert. I don't 100% see eye to eye with this analogy though, because honestly all three games are main course worthy. I mean, they're all in the top 15 for crying out loud, and I've played all three of these games pretty regularly since the first game released in 1994. However, from me playing all of these games multiple times for so very long, I will admit that as I look at all three games individually, the second one just always seems to stand out the most for me, and I think that's why I have it not only the highest, but also in the top five. From its adventurous pirate thematics, to its challenging but engaging difficulty, to its excellent platforming and boss fights, and I would be an absolute fool not to even mention the music. Hands down, of all the games you see on this list, DKC2 might just have the best soundtrack on the entire SNES library. David Wise was an absolute legend when he composed this game, and I'll be real with you, if someone ever asked me what my favorite song is from this game, well, 
you're not getting a single answer from me. In fact, you're probably just going to get a comprehensive list of every song in the game because you cannot pick an absolute best from this list. Stickerbrush Symphony, Forest Interlude, Snowbound Land, Crocodile Cacophony, Lockjaw Saga, Bayou Boogie, Hothead Bop, Mining Melancholy. See, I'm doing it right now. Anyway, some say that Rareware was at their best when it came to the Nintendo 64, and while I do agree that they had a really great thing going on in that console, to me they really started to get their momentum strong when it came to the SNES's Donkey Kong Country series, and Donkey Kong Country 2, I think, is the best example of that. Number 4. I think for every series or genre of game, there is always going to be that one game that cements yourself as a fan of that series, or that particular genre. And for me, number 4 is the perfect example of that, because not only did this game cement me as a fan of the series, but in an indirect way, it kind of just led me to creating my future online username. Kirby Superstar is the game taking the number 4 spot on this list. And, yeah, if you couldn't tell, this game is and will always be my favorite Kirby game. I mean, why else would I have chosen this game to be my very first walkthrough back in 2007 when I started my YouTube channel? Anyway, let's get down to business here. Why is this considered to be my Kirby game, or to be more precise, why is this so high on my list of top SNES games? From the look of it, when you compare it with other Kirby games from its time, it may not seem like anything too special. You swallow enemies, you get their powers, and you use them to defeat any enemies and bosses in your way until you get to the end of the game. However, in most of these other games, the abilities themselves would only give you a one button, one function power or attack. In Superstar, they actually give the power-ups a little more than that, making each copy ability feel like something you could feasibly take along with you for the long haul if you so wanted. Of course you never do, because the powers are so interesting that as soon as you see a new one pop up later, you can't help but switch it out and give that one a go instead. But still, I think my point pretty much stands. The power-ups in this game are really, really fun to use. Even a seemingly somewhat simple one like Beam is more than just a diagonal whip attack in front of Kirby like it's been in other games, but you can also use it defensively from the back to charge up a super powerful Beam Blast, or put the pressure on your foes in front of you by doing a downwards aerial projectile attack while closing in with a strong burst of static orbs if your foes survive the onslaught. Everything just feels so much more developed in this game when you compare it with not only what came before it, but also a few games that came afterwards as well. Gone are the days where fire is just a fireball, or cutter is just a single cutter blade you throw. There's way more personality and utility, which makes it a more fun experience. And you know what else makes it a more fun experience? Having a buddy join alongside you. And no, I'm not just talking about the computer AI that can join you and die every 5 seconds, but if you have another person joining for the ride, you can actually add them to the action as well on the second controller, making this incredibly fun single player game also an exciting cooperative multiplayer experience as well. And the fact that you can both have two different power-ups, allowing you to mix and match and have different uh, battle strategies for boss fights, just makes the experience more interesting and different each time you play the game, especially if you play with different people who have different favorite copy abilities. The last thing I want to mention in regards to this game and how much it has going for it is the fact that this is not just a simple Kirby game, but rather seven different Kirby games in one. Sure, I wouldn't say any of the individual games are long enough to warrant being their own SNES game or anything. I mean, Spring Breeze is already just a shorter version of Kirby's Dreamland for the Game Boy as it is, but each mode has its own charm and feel going for it. As I mentioned before, Spring Breeze is an easy nostalgic callback, a game that won't take you very long to complete, but give you enough of a taste for wanting a bit more. Dynablade, although still easy, gets you more familiar with the new mechanics and power-ups you'll be working with. The Great Cave Offensive, perhaps the mode you'll be spending the most time with, will really test your perfectionist puzzle-solving treasure hunting intuitions as you literally scan the entire area looking for treasure and trying to solve all the puzzles that the game has to offer. Revenge of Meta Knight gives you a sense of urgency as a deadly group of warriors led by Meta Knight try to lead an assault on Dreamland while Kirby must infiltrate the battleship Halberd and put an end to Meta Knight's dastardly deeds. There's Gourmet Race, and 
eating racing minigame. And then the game culminates with the finale, known as Milky Way Wishes. While on the surface doesn't seem too out of the ordinary in terms of general progression, it does mix up things a bit by taking away Kirby's ability to swallow enemies for their powers, but offers a more permanent solution if you can locate those abilities in another way. Adding a challenge by removing a convenience, but giving a more permanent solution if you are insightful enough. And then, once you beat that, you are introduced to the first inclusion of the Kirby series arena. And sure, other Kirby games have had boss endurances before, but this is the first time I feel like they got the boss endurance right, making it less about turning every boss into a no-hit challenge, but more about picking the right power-up for each boss fight and saving your healing items when you think you need them the most. And the order is also mostly randomized, so each run will feel relatively different as well. And these reasons alone pretty much explain why most modern Kirby games use this format for the arena. And if all these modes still aren't enough for you, there are two additional minigames on top of this, showing that this game really doesn't know when to stop when it comes to content, and I'm all for that. Sure, even with all this substance, Kirby Superstar is still probably not the longest game on this list. Heck, even Super Mario World 2 and Donkey Kong Country 2 might take me a bit longer in a 100% context, but since it does offer the variety that it does, you never really feel like you come out of the experience feeling still hungry or too stuffed. It's just the right amount of content for a really solid gaming experience. Also, the game looks and sounds great and feels really great to play as well. A perfect candidate for fourth place. Number three. Let's be real here. If there is one genre that really stands tall and strong in the SNES, it's the RPG genre. In fact, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised or opposed to someone turning in a top 15 list like this using only SNES RPGs. They're really, really that good on this system. And look, I know we haven't seen too many on this particular list, but as you guys know, I'm rather fond and big of the platformer genre too, and probably lean more towards that due to simplicity. However, I am still quite fond of RPGs, and I've played a great number of them over the years, each with their own unique battle systems and deep storylines. However, for those who love RPGs, you never forget your very first one. And for me, that RPG was none other than Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Sure, I wouldn't say this story gets as deep as Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger, and I wouldn't say the battle system is as heavily constructed as those games either, but Super Mario RPG was still very unique, and I think it held its own for its time as well. In fact, I'd almost say Super Mario RPG was a solid gateway into the RPG realm, using the familiarity of Mario characters and enemies while introducing the RPG mechanics on a very elementary level, enough to get people interested without overly intimidating those who may not be ready for something as deep as Final Fantasy. Heck, even during my first playthrough of Super Mario RPG, I couldn't grasp the concept or simple idea of leveling up your characters to get stronger. I just tried to brute force my way through every fight, not realizing that every time I got that level up screen, the numbers that I'd see during battle were different than what they were before. But I didn't care because we am playing as Mario in a 3D isometric environment. Over time though, when I did start grasping the concept of an RPG and the game's fundamental mechanics, the experience definitely got a lot more engaging for me. Every new playthrough led to a new discovery, whether it was a hidden item or weapon I never found before, a new strategy that completely wrecked a boss that I used to have trouble with. Heck, even during my SNES Classic Completion playthrough, I did a run where the only move I used with Mario was his jump attack, just to watch the power of that special move increase to ludicrous amounts throughout the game, since every time you use that move, it gets stronger over time. And when an RPG, a genre that tends to last a lot longer than a traditional platformer, encourages and welcomes that amount of replayability, I think that's something to take notice of. Super Mario RPG may not be my favorite Mario RPG title, that honor does and will always belong to Paper Mario on the N64, at least in my eyes, but you can't deny the effect that this game has had on not only the creation of that series, but also the Mario & Luigi series as well. Not just because the portly plumber is the main hero in the box art, but because both of those games heavily rely on the concept of timed hits and action commands during battle. Something that was very well established here in Super Mario RPG. In some ways, you could say Super Mario RPG had to walk in order for Paper Mario and Mario & Luigi to run. 
To me, I wouldn't even simplify it to that degree because Super Mario RPG definitely doesn't just walk. If anything, it runs just along with them and it kind of stands on its own pedestal for being such a perfect blend of Mario and Final Fantasy. Some of the characters, enemies, and bosses you see in this game don't really fit that traditional Mario mold, but that's why they're so interesting and intriguing to me. As a kid, I thought the character Gino was really, really cool, and I even had a blue shirt that I used to call my Gino shirt. And you know, even I'll admit that Gino probably isn't the most logical character to get representation in Super Smash Bros, but because of my history with the character in this game, you won't see me opposing his inclusion if he did manage to make it in the roster. It just shows that this game has a special place in a lot of people's hearts, much like its own placement in mine. So yeah, while Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger have a lot going for them and are truly masterpieces in their own right, without the masterpiece of Super Mario RPG, I don't know when or if I would have ever experienced any of these other SNES classic titles. It's an amazing game with engaging gameplay and characters, incredibly catchy music, a charming script with hilarious dialogue, and a tremendous heart and spirit that any gamer would be proud of to have in their gaming collection. Also, why the hell is this game not on Switch's SNES Online service? I mean, come on, seriously. What the f- Number two. We have reached the final two games on this list, so as you might expect, these games are both heavy hitters in their own right. And let's be real, most of you are probably aware of what these two finalists are, just based on my previous speeches and my own personal actions. So let's not hold our suspense any longer and say hello to our runner-up, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Now, I know what you're all thinking, Slim, this is only up here because of randomizer, isn't it? While it may be true that I have enjoyed the occasional hundreds of randomizer playthroughs I've done over the past five years, let me be frank with my words here that Link to the Past randomizer couldn't be as good as it is without the original game being as good as it is. And let me tell you, Link to the Past doesn't need me to defend its place in not just SNES greatness, but also in all-time video game greatness as well. But since that's kind of the point of this list, I think I can still rap about it for a bit. In much of the same vein as I mentioned earlier with Super Metroid, Link to the Past got a lot of the same treatment here, being a definitive upgrade of what came previously. Now, I'm not saying this to put the original Legend of Zelda down or anything. If anything, I think Zelda NES aged better than Metroid NES, if I'm being quite honest. But perhaps upgrade isn't the best word to use. Maybe evolution is the better term to be used. The world is more detailed and defined, the people and characters are more direct and meaningful, the combat feels more fluid, and the items have more utility and purpose. You enter a cave and find an old man, and instead of him mentioning a very vague location that might have a secret of some kind, you get some lore and a better indication of something valuable you might find there that you could use on your journey. So while some could make the argument that the original Zelda had a bigger world to explore, I'd argue that Link to the Past has a deeper world to explore, giving value to every acre of the world in both the light and dark world no less. And with an expanded inventory, one that features more than just the standard upgrades to Link's already famous arsenal, it's hard not to get pumped with this brand new repertoire of tools and trinkets. This game alone introduced two of my favorite Zelda items, the Cane of Samaria, a magic item that has puzzle utility, but can also be used for some decently ranged magic attacks, and perhaps one of Link's most renowned tools, the Hookshot, a lengthy chain that can pull you towards unreachable ledges, but can also be used to stun some of the more obnoxious and rambunctious enemies you'll have to contend with. Even the dungeons themselves get more definitive upgrades in this evolution. Sure, they may not be as puzzle-centric as some of the more modern 3D Zelda titles, but each dungeon feels unique and has its own theme going for it. Whether you're exploring all the different crypts of Skull Woods looking for the right keys and path to the boss, or trudging through the waters of Swamp Palace to find the right flood switches, each dungeon is its own adventure and has its own identity. Something that can't really be said for its predecessor. Again, not to put the predecessor down or anything, all video games have to start somewhere, and Zelda 1 had a phenomenal start, no question about it. But Link to the Past had that charm that has stuck with me from the very first time I completed it, to even after my 200th randomizer playthrough, and I think that says a lot for how great this game really is. Heck, another one of the more unobvious factors I appreciate about this game 
is actually how surprisingly non-linear the game can be around the midway point. Yeah, the game does kind of railroad you through the first couple of dungeons, but once you make it through the first Dark World dungeon, you actually have a bit of a choice for how you want to proceed through the following sections. You can continue going in the sequential crystal order, or you can move ahead to crystal number 3 or 4 if the mood fits you. In fact, the boss of Crystal Dungeon 3 is probably one of the hardest bosses to take on casually for the first time, but if you fully complete Crystal Dungeon 4 and get the dungeon item, you can actually get access to an upgrade that'll make the boss of Dungeon 3 significantly easier. Fully embracing that notion I love about exploration games, where the more you explore and experiment with, the more you can potentially get rewarded with your own individual persistence. Not only do I find that particularly cool about these types of games, but this is also the reason why I think Link to the Past Randomizer is such a great randomizer, because the game itself was built and structured well enough to support those randomizer options. Many, many years ago, I honestly would have never put two and two together about The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. In fact, 15 years ago, when I made this list before, I don't think this game was even in my top five, but it just goes to show you that over time, taste can most certainly change, and sometimes it takes something like a randomizer to see the potential for how truly amazing and special a game truly is. Before we finish this list up with my number one choice, there are a few honorable mentions I would like to make for some games I had considered putting on this list, but didn't quite make the cut for one reason or another. Earthbound is another one of those very special RPGs with a lot of heart and soul, and a very unique and special identity. And although it didn't make this list, it's an adventure that stuck with me, and is one that was at least worth mentioning. Super Bomberman is another game that also has a lot of special meaning to me, mainly from those old family gatherings I used to have with my dad's side of the family, and we'd get together for some fun and hysterical four-player multiplayer matches. Plus, I kind of enjoyed the single-player adventure mode in this game as well, so I thought this game was worth mentioning. Capcom had a very productive line on the SNES, particularly when it came to its licensed content. And one game that has always stood out to me in this front was The Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse, a game that I actually found myself renting quite a number of times when I was younger. And for the fourth honorable mention, let's mention a pair of games that also have to do with the number four in the form of Final Fantasy IV and Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, which just so happens to be the fourth Fire Emblem game. These are two games that I've actually only played through once, and fairly recently too, I might add, so they're both still fairly unfamiliar to me, but I still found them to be very enjoyable and memorable when I played through them, and thought they were both very worth mentioning in this list as a result. So without further ado, let's move on to the first place position. Slim Kirby's number one favorite SNES game is... Okay, I may have had one more honorable mention. Come on guys, I couldn't have gone this entire list without mentioning something in regards to pieces. So yeah, I know the joke, pieces, game of the year, yada yada yada, Slim Kirby has to mention his meme game in some form. But I have to be honest here, I do really really love this game. And I did honestly consider putting it on this list, because it is truly the reason why I love video games so much. Because no matter the theme or concept, anything can work as a video game as long as it has some real substance behind it. And the substance here is, well, it's a Jigsaw Puzzle Simulator. And just so you know, I love Jigsaw Puzzles, so it's no wonder this game caught my eye so easily when I first saw it. Much in the same way that Mario Party caught my eye when I first saw it, because, well, I love board games too. Anyway, with a short single-player campaign where you race computer AI to finish sets of jigsaw puzzles, a one versus one multiplayer mode, and a very casual single-player and multiplayer mode where you can just sit back, relax, and do themed jigsaw puzzles at your own leisure, 
I'd say there is actually some good content here that is worth experiencing, or even coming back to if you've played this game before. So yeah, Pieces, it's not just a Joker meme game. I honestly think it's a really genuinely good game, and those who have played it definitely know where I'm coming from. It may be a very simple concept, but it's still a lot of fun and a game that I think is worth talking about. Number one. Okay guys, let's actually get back to business here and talk about my favorite SNES game. I'm sure to many, or at least most, this choice will not come as a surprise to anyone here. It's Super Mario World. I know, that's not very suspenseful, but I've talked very positively about this game many times in the past, and it's a game that really doesn't need any sort of fancy introduction either. To many, this was their first SNES game, and it was most definitely mine as well, but more than that, this was also my very first video game. And I'm sure you guys are coming at me with your you're just blind and or wearing nostalgia goggles comments, and I'll be real, there is no escaping the nostalgia for me on this one, but in a case like this, I think we need to think realistically here. You are never going to forget your first definitive video gaming moment. That moment when you pick up the controller, press a few buttons, and see a magical world inside the television start to move and come alive based on your actions. I had this experience when I was only two or three years old when I visited my aunt and uncle's house who had recently gotten an SNES of their own. I watched for hours as my family took turns playing the game while I was sitting on my mother's lap. At one point I asked if I could try the game as well, and instead of giving me the obvious no way you're too young response, my family decided to approach the scenario in a different way, handing me a controller and letting my imagination run wild. Of course I had no idea that the controller I was given was not hooked up to anything, so my button inputs weren't doing a single thing while another family member secretly controlled the active controller from the sidelines. Cut me some slack, I was still trying to perfect my ability to walk and talk at this point in my life. I don't think my brain was quite ready for basic electronic troubleshooting just yet. After several months of this charade, literally my aunt and father decided it was time to actually throw caution to the wind and allow me to start playing the actual game. And from my understanding, I didn't actually do too bad. I had a few deaths for sure, I mean everyone has a bit of trouble going from training wheels to no training wheels when learning how to ride a bike, but just from what I had observed from earlier sessions, I knew what to expect and had a general idea of the typical movement behavior from observing others play. So before I knew it, I was not dying as much and could actually beat or make significant progress through quite a number of the early game levels. About a year later, in the Christmas of 1992, my parents decided to get me my own SNES and my own copy of Super Mario World. And from that point on, my journey as a gamer officially began. Super Mario World was most likely the first video game I'd ever beaten, and although I don't have too much of a frame of mind for when that happened or how long it took, it was still a momentous occasion for me, and the first time I saw the princess fall down from that Koopa Clown car at the end of the game had to have been my first big gaming victory. Over the years as I got new games and tried new series and even inherited my dad's Game Boy, my library and gaming resume started to expand. But Super Mario World was always there to be that comfort title of mine. That game I would go back to if I kept getting Game Overs and Donkey Kong Country and Link to the Past just because I had beaten the game before and I knew I could get a victory. Eventually it got to a point where I noticed that some parts of the world map stood out more than others, and that allowed me to discover the notion of secret exits and finding every secret level and shortcut throughout the game. And that developed into my completionist nature when it comes to gaming just so I have the pleasure of experiencing every single bit of the game that the developers intended for discovery. And nowadays, due to my experience and longevity with this title, a 100% 96 exit playthrough is pretty much the standard for me, and it's not too out of the realm of possibility for me to complete the task in a very short, rounded down 2 hour time frame. It's no world record time by any means, but my younger self would probably be blown away by such an accomplishment, considering by that game time back then, I was probably only just making it to the Forest of Illusion. And keep in mind, I'm not even talking about 100% here either. 
I think what gives Super Mario World the edge for me is just how accessible it is as a video game. It controls very well and movement feels very fluid and smooth. Gone are the days of Super Mario Bros where jumping can feel a little off at times, whether it's from the type of tricky jumps the developers ask you to make in some of the harder levels, or just the general feel of making a jump and feeling like you have to commit to it since pulling back will completely nullify any momentum you had and causing you to sink straight down. Here it just feels like you have full control over Mario, and if you need to set up a tricky maneuver, you have plenty of time to do so, even with a bad false start. Plus, you even have some great power-ups and items that can help you out and make platforming less scary and tedious. Getting to those power-ups, while I do think Super Mario Bros. 3 offers a greater variety of new power-ups and forms, I think Super Mario World does just fine with the few that it does have at its disposal, which is really just Fire Mario, Kate Mario, and Yoshi. Some would consider the latter two power-ups to be incredibly broken, though, with Kate Mario giving you a lot of safety during platforming sections, and just the general ability to fly over everything if you know how to use it, and Yoshi offering not only an extra hit and some flying capabilities, but also an extra higher jump if you're about to fall to your doom, or to reach a higher area through an unconventional means. While I do agree that these can trivialize a bit of the challenge of this game, I also see them as a potential, but also optional reward for holding onto them for extended periods of time. You don't have to use these methods for beating the game, and I feel like the design of Super Mario World, if anything, tries to discourage you from doing so because of the secret exits and alternate paths that the game offers. Flying over every single level of the game, for the levels that you can do that with anyway, will not get you to the end of the game. You'll still have to find some secret exits, and some levels, namely the cave and castle levels, won't really let you do that anyway. Plus, I don't know about you guys, but even during those stages where I just so happen to be flying high in the sky, I still can't help but take a dip down every now and then just to see what's going on and play the stage normally anyway. I guess the magic of Super Mario World just continues to draw me into it, no matter how many times I've played it and how many times I've tried to power through it. It's just that engaging of an experience. Dinosaur Land is just a really, really cool place to be. I still think one of the coolest things about this world was when I first made it to World 2 on my own all of those years ago. I had just beat Yoshi's Island in the first Koopaling of this game, I pressed the button that allows you to scroll the world map screen, and I was just in awe at how big the world was and how extensive this adventure was. There were mountains, forests, rocky plateaus, an island in the middle of nowhere which I later found out was one of the Star World entrances. My mind was literally going through every kind of flabbergastable feeling in the book, just wondering when I would get to this place and what other secrets I could find along the way on this great journey. And sure, while I can't get that same feeling these days, since I have beaten this game hundreds and hundreds of times, those initial feelings are still deep in my memory banks, and I remember those times fondly and vividly. I remember the first time I accessed a new world or beat a level I was stuck in for several days and or weeks. I remember the first time I saved the princess and saw the credits for the first time. I remember the first time I beat the special world and the color of the entire world changed along with even some of the enemy designs. So many memories have been made of this game, and even to this day I still feel like I'm making new ones. I remember going over to Madame Wario's apartment one day when she wasn't feeling well and she asked me if I could play through the game while she watched. I did so and that was the first time I ever beat the special world without dying. I remember running the game for a small community marathon for the speed gamers and having to drastically change my route to get to a save point because my computer was trying to install an update during the run. I remember streaming a Super Mario World randomizer seed for one of my anniversary streams and getting a 10,000 bit donation during it. I have 100%ed Super Mario World's retro achievement set on two different occasions. I've done challenge runs of the game where I try to collect all the dragon coins and 3-up moons called Lunar Dragon Runs. I've played through the game trying not to collect any power-ups and staying as Small Mario. Done a couple of co-op runs with my friends on Switch Online. I've played through this game so many times and continue to get so much out of this game, so much more than I ever thought possible, and almost to the point where I should have gotten everything out of this game by now. But I just can't put it down or out of my mind. And even speaking so fondly of this game now, it's making me want to play it all over again. How could this game not be my favorite SNES game? A game that's done so much for me, 
not only as a gamer, but also as a human being. I love this game, and I always will. And I'll tell you guys this right now. If I ever retire from YouTube in the future, the last thing I'm going to do on this channel is do another playthrough of Super Mario World. Because not only did that game start my wonderful life as a gamer, I can't think of a better game to conclude my wonderful life as a YouTuber. But that's for a much different and hopefully not too soon time. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why Super Mario World is my number one favorite SNES game. Well guys, that was quite the mouthful I got through, but I am quite satisfied with how this video and this top 15 list came out, despite how lengthy this will likely end up being. Keep in mind though, back when I made my first list in 2007, I only had a 7 minute time limit to work with, not to mention it was my first time editing and making a video in general, and I didn't even have commentary with it either. Now that times have changed, and I like to think that I've gotten a lot more analytical with age, there was a lot more for me to say and take a look at when making a list like this, so I hope you guys enjoyed it for those particular reasons. Although I still have plenty of SNES games to play and check out still, not to mention I could see some games getting even higher ranks on future list revisits, I think this list is pretty final for the time being, and I don't really see myself revisiting this topic anytime soon. However, if you guys would be so interested in seeing some other lists like this in the future, be sure to let me know in the comments section. Also, let me know what some of your favorite SNES games are, whether we share some of the same titles in our respective lists, or even if there's another game that wasn't mentioned at all. I'd really love to hear what you guys think. Well everyone, we've come a long way in 15 years of YouTube, and I look forward to seeing what the future will hold on here, and just in gaming in general. Thank you all for your continued support, and following me here for as long as you have, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Later folks.